those that are coming from the perspective of dreams, visions, and things don't happen today. They happened with the clothes of the apostles and things like that. Where do we get in Scripture a scriptural foundation before we tell the stories that these things are for believers today and they do happen? Well, one, the Bible doesn't say it stopped. There was this one woman who I knew. Um, she was a prior Jehovah's Witness, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but she was a prior Jehovah's Witness who gave her life to Jesus Christ. But here's what happens when you, when anybody who is in a cult, uh, like Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism and things like that, what happened is, is that they're, um, for lack of better words, they are indoctrinated. And a lot of people are even indoctrinated with denominations where it's hard for people to break away from what they, what their foundation had been in religiosity. So her thing was speaking in tongues, miracles, signs, wonders no longer happen because she believes it's been desensationalized. So I would ask this woman, I said, why do you believe this? And mind you, this woman was dying of cancer. So when she said this, I said, why do you believe this? And she couldn't under, she couldn't articulate why. So it took her about two weeks to come back to me. She came back to me and she said, well, here in, I think it's first Corinthians, um, the love chapter. I'm pretty sure that's love uh -huh. Corinthians three. Um, it talks about in tongues will cease. Yes, it will. But you know, what it's going to cease when Jesus comes in and do the comes for the, the millennium reign. You won't need that anymore. But as of right now, you do need that. So so there's so the scripture you're referencing. So the scripture you're referencing says they'll all cease when we see him face to face. Exactly. And we have Which not is, all seen him face to face. Right. So it continues. Yeah. Exactly. And then Acts, Acts talks about daughters will prophesy, your young men will dream dreams, this kind of thing. Right. So exactly. it's scripturally sound. Exactly. And then you even see more in the Old Testament where it says how the Lord will speak to you in dreams, how he'll give you dreams in the middle of the night when you're when you're your when your conscience is more aware and he can tell you things more than likely because we're so occupied with life. And then even when you talk about King Solomon, he became wise through a dream. The Lord asked him literally through a dream, what do you want? God was so impressed with him. He didn't ask for money, fame, any of that. He just asked for wisdom. And through that dream alone, he became the wisest man who ever lived. So these are, dreams are so important. Um, and miracles still happen today. I mean, we all experience miracles. People sometimes say, I haven't experienced a, uh, a miracle. I haven't seen it. Even you have the religious people. Mind you, the non-religious people I have found believe more in the supernatural than the religious people. Can you believe that? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it still happens today. And even it's in times when we don't even realize it's a miracle. Like you have no idea what God does when you are unaware of certain instances. Say if you're walking down a street and there's like some somebody who's out to say rob someone. And for some reason you look down in your pocket to check some or check your phone. And because of your reaction, they skipped over you and got somebody else. Those are miracles. You know, God just works in so many ways. We just need to pay attention. We're so occupied. But no, absolutely. According to scripture, this has not failed yet. This has not stopped yet. And it truly is the work of the enemy. Because if you stop believing that God works today, he becomes like all the other false gods in the world. And every last one who is not Jesus Christ is false. Is false. So he, they, they're basically making God or you can't make him less than what he is but in their mind they make him less than what he is so they're basically saying God does not do this God does not do that God, God does not do this but who are you the question God who are we to even say God does not he is omnipotent he's so powerful um, there's no limitations to what he can do and when you bring down that wall that's when you'll begin to see miracle signs wonders in your life and when you truly surrender surrender your life to Jesus. So, yeah. So when, what's kind of the first, maybe the first time you remember something you thought was uh, not more than a coincidence and it could have been God, but some kind of something divine. 
Okay, so this, it was cute. So this was cute. I was, and this is what I learned a lot. I feel like I was a wise little girl. So my grandmother, she had this necklace. She loved Jesus so much. And she had this necklace that she had given to me. And in the necklace, it was, um, I don't know, maybe it was like an oval shape, a gold necklace. And if you were to look inside, you can see the Lord's Prayer. The whole Lord's Prayer inside is a teeny, you put your eye through the little lens and you can see the Lord's Prayer. She had given it to me. And three days later, it was gone. And I said to myself, oh my, oh my. It was a cross, I'm sorry, it was a cross with a little circle in the middle. And I said, oh my goodness. And I had to be about 10 or 11 years old. So back then we walked everywhere. We walked to church, we walked to, and it was pretty safe. So I walked to church one day and I was so excited because I said, this disappeared. And in my mind, I'm thinking, because Jesus got off the cross three days later. So this is my thinking as a 10 year old girl, you know, my grandma gave it to me this day, three days later on the cross, it was gone. So I'm like, okay, so, um, uh, you know, this is, I thought it was a miracle. So I showed the women at church, the, the women who were high up in a church, and they were so sweet. Mind you, like the women at the church were phenomenal. They said, oh, honey, oh, Jenny, I don't think that's what that means. I don't think so. And you couldn't tell me otherwise. <laughs> so they told me this, and I said, no, I think it is. And they said, okay, whatever, believe what you want. And from that instance, because I believed, my belief grew more and more and more. But that's when I realized the truth about how you have to be careful, one, who you say things to, because the Bible says not to cast um, your pearls upon swine. And then two is that church folks, I learned this at 10 years old, be careful of church folks. And I know this is getting a little deep, but there's one thing to be um, a born again believer in Jesus Christ living a life and a church folks. So what is a church folks? Church folks are considered those who go to church Sunday do what they need to do, and then live the rest of their life, um, whatever they want until the next Sunday. Or those who are even active in a church, their whole life is a church, but they don't live the life. So it's one thing you can go into church all you want. You can be there, be active, be an usher, be a secretary, be whatever you want. But you need, and this is why God says to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, because if you're in a church the whole entire time, you are not doing much at all, unless that's your occupation and that's what you do. Um, but I learned that church folks will often steal your joy and steal your faith because they are not there because they are not growing. And um, I even had times where I had to, uh, for lack of better words, I had to disconnect myself from those people who were professing Christians, very nice people. But every time I got around them, my my faith would diminish inch by inch by inch by inch. And I realize it's the spirits that's with them because they don't have the belief that I believe. And because I believe all these supernatural experiences happen to me, I truly know for sure it's because I didn't put caps and limitations on God. So the first time to answer your question, the first time that I really experienced something of the supernatural was when I had my little necklace and um, the Lord's Prayer disappeared on the cross. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What you're talking about, I grew up in as well, where I call it church culture. And I mean, it's better to be in church than out of church. But it's uh, Wednesday nights, it was Sundays it, mornings, it was Sunday evenings. All the activities, all the friends were based around church or church people. And you can only you can never get enough of scripture, but it's supposed to feed an inner spirit for a for power and service, but it ends up being an endless life of Bible study and do's and don'ts. And you get trapped in this religious cycle of a separate between secular and sacred that I don't think should be there because you're supposed to live and walk in the spirit. And you can't, if you never, like you're saying, are out in the world to do it. You're never a light in the darkness. You're a bunch of lights just lighting each other. And I think that goes dim, you know? Exactly. It becomes lifeless. And from what I see from the New Testament, in Paul's writings is that church is supposed to be for believers, one, and it's where the gifts, uh, where the teachers are, where gifts are, anything to encourage, build, make you strong enough to go back in for the six-day week 
out into a dark world and do something meaningful, not a place of refuge and to hide. You know, except in those times in life where you do need a refuge, but you know what I mean. It's um, yep. it's like don't forget to gather together because there's important things there, but it's turned into um, you can't leave. It almost becomes cultish in that that Christian community becomes so tight that uh, I can't go out with secular friends. I can't do secular this. And and how else would you reach them if you don't look out for them? them? It's like they called Jesus a drunkard and all these things because he hung out with the sinner. So that's a religious spirit that, you know, you were just mentioning. So what, uh, I, as far as experiences go, there's a part of me that doesn't like, even though I started a podcast as well on divine encounters. So I'm being hypocritical here. Um, but there's a part of me that doesn't like to focus on that because you can lead people just into looking for that. And then that's where their faith is. However, Christ attracted people and it added validity to his word and testimony that even the critics said, you must be from God um, because nobody else could do these things, which were signs and wonders, and uh, divine encounters of sorts. So it's a balance, right? I mean, as far as... Um, you can have people not come to true faith because they're searching for the next miracle or divine thing. But um, what in your life, what other experiences brought you to where you're at and what you're doing now? Okay. Well, one, to respond to what you said, I totally, totally agree. This is why the supernatural life is supposed to be uh, a lifestyle. So super, for instance, so when you talk about miracles, question for you, Ken. Would you rather have miracles or blessings? <laughs> to me, they're one and the same, right? I don't know. No. I feel like it's a trick question. They're not no. Oh, okay. So, so miracles happen in instances where you need survival. You need. You just need. You're at a dire s space where the only thing that can save you is a miracle. But then, when you have blessings, you're constantly walking in it day after day after day where good is happening to you. The Lord's hand is on everything you're doing. But so me personally, I would rather have blessings than miracles. We need miracles in times where it's hard, where times where there's nothing else that can change it unless a move of God. So that's the difference. So so I believe that we need both, but it needs to be a lifestyle where we walk in the supernatural, where it's not just it turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off. Because we are supernatural beings because, I mean, we are spirit and we have a soul. So those are supernatural things that um, so are active. And then so let's see other other things that a supernatural life. OK, so I think you read this in the first part of my book. And this was kind of the inception of how I started my journey with the Lord. And that was a demon possessed person in the church. Do you remember that part? Ken? I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Right. So um, we had come from a Baptist church. My father was Baptist. And, um, you know, they didn't believe in miracle signs or wonders or um, they didn't know what to do if a demon possessed, demon possessed person even came into the church. They probably called the police. My mother, she says, okay. She tells my dad, she's like, okay, I love you very much because they're both, both ministers. But she said, I have, to, I have to go to a church where I can grow because I know that I'm missing out. Um, on some things. My father said, okay, sure, it's fine. You can do that. So we go to a Pentecostal church and I had never been to a Pentecostal church before. And I always believed in God because of my parents. Uh, and I always loved Jesus very much, but I never saw the works and the acts of God until I went to this church that I um, could remember until we were worshiping. It was a small church, probably a church of 30 people. And we were in the second story of another church. So it was a beautiful stone church in Philadelphia. And on top, we rented um, the upstairs. And we had a room where we had the services. I'm sorry. So when we had the services, uh, they would always worship. And they would worship hard. And they would worship mm. long. And they would worship loud. So there was. this is the first time I went to this church. And as they worshiped, a woman started to convulge. And she began to shake. And the next thing I know, they're telling all the kids to face the wall, face the wall, face the wall. 
And I'm like, why are they telling us to face? I don't want to face the wall. I want to see what's going on. This is entertainment for me as a kid, you know? So, um, so I'm facing the wall and I hear the pastor. She runs off the stage and lays hands on this woman and the name of Jesus come out of her, come out of her, come out of her. And I had never seen anything like that ever in my life. And then as the years progressed, there was another girl I mentioned, I think in the first chapter of my book, I think she was a 17 year old girl. And um, I was younger than most of the teenagers there. I was about probably 13 years old. And this young girl comes in. She was living a lot. I don't know what her lifestyle was, but you could tell it was a rough life. Sweetheart, you know, sweet soul. But you could tell she was having a hard life. So when the pastor asked whoever would like to give their life to Jesus, come forward. She came forward. But as she came forward, she began to run. And when I said she runs, she darted for the exit. The dangerous part of this is that off of that door was a balcony. And she tried to dive off literally like that. The, and it wasn't her. It was the spirits in her trying to kill her. But thank God there were two male ushers by the door who slammed the door right away. And they held her. Not forcefully. They just held her so she wouldn't try to forcefully open a door. The pastor said, bring her to me. Bring her to me now. And she began to pray over her. She said, bring me the oil, bring me the oil. They brought her the oil and she began to speak to the spirit inside of her. And she began to command the spirit to come out of her because this girl wanted Jesus. She wanted Jesus, but she didn't have control because these demons had possessed her body. And as she prayed over her, I heard this woman, this young lady say, I want Jesus. I want, and she began to cry and this girl was free. And I never saw anything like, like this before. I mean, this woman, she was her face was distorted. I just never saw anything like that before. But um, she come out. She had come out of it. And when she came out of it, she was free. She was happy. You saw a new light around her. She even glue. So the power of God, I saw the power of God. And my sister, my older sister, who's about four years older than me, she said, you cannot look at that and say there is no God. Right. Because if God can take something like that out of, out of a human being, I mean, you can't yep. challenge that. Yeah, you mentioned the Corinthians before, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. You know, Paul said that what church should be is for believers, and when unbelievers come in, the experience they have, they should fall on their faces or knees and say, God is really in this place. And that's not the experience we would have in most churches today. <laughs> Especially that's, in America, yeah, you're in America. Yeah. So I kind of define things as I go along because a lot of listeners aren't um, well versed in denominations or even Christian. So when you mention Pentecostalism, find that as a Christian denomination that does believe and accept that the gifts of the Spirit, which were used by the early church, really um, have never gone away. Uh, Scripture doesn't say they'd go away, and most theologians, which are like Bible scholars, really just point to history that they've gone away because there isn't biblical proof of it. And history is is not a cure for understanding Scripture at all. Um, otherwise, salvation would have went away until Martin Luther and the Reformation, right? So it was like a phase. Yeah, here's how to get saved again. It's by grace. It's not by works. And then the next phase were awakenings where people began to experience uh, the power of the spirit. And, um, so Pentecostals are, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. Um, and once you, you can see things, but once you experience uh, Christianity to me is the only thing that makes logical sense. It answers philosophical questions, um, scientific questions, but it takes the Holy spirit to show you the truth of Christ, even if though it all adds up. But when you add a what I call divine encounter, but an experience with the Holy Spirit, there's just no going back. Um, ridicule, nothing matters to you anymore because something so real, uh, you'll never be out debated on it. You'll just never, uh, there's something in you, well, the Holy Spirit, that just doesn't, doesn't allow it. So you saw things, what led to more of the experience in your life of the movement of the Holy Spirit or as you grew or matured? It's simple. I didn't doubt. And I think I mentioned that in my book. I didn't put God in limitations. 
And I truly believe that a way to lose that is to surround yourself with those who doubt. And I call it unbeliever believers, because if you're around unbelievers, they don't believe that's fine. You know, not, you know, fine as an eternal standpoint, but that's common. But I just did not doubt that God couldn't do something. I believed and I knew that anything was possible for him and I expected it. I expected uh, God to always come through for me. I expect him to be there. Um, And I think I mentioned this also, if not, I mentioned it somewhere else. But imagine like, say, Ken, you asked me to be on here on this show. And I say, yes. But then you're thinking, she's not going to come on. She's not going to be on. How would that make, you know, how would that make me feel, you know, because if you're asking me for something and you're like, I don't think she's going to do it. Would that make me even want to do it? I would probably be like, maybe I don't want to because Ken, <laughs> because Ken doesn't believe I'll be on. That's the same thing with God. If you ask God for something, expect him to do it. But a lot of times we ask God for things and truly inside doubt that he's going to do it. And God loves, he, he's moved by faith. The Bible said he is moved by faith. And that means we're not doubting. We're not second guessing. We expect him to. Um, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know a lot of people say they said if, if he doesn't come for us. But there is a translation that actually is different where it says that when he comes for us or something like that, it, it, it's the... Um, It's the original context. I don't know if it was written in Hebrew, what part it was written in, but where it is actually said when he would come for us, when the Lord would come for us. So they believe. So when we believe God has to, he has to come through without a shadow of a doubt. You stand on the word of God. He's going to do it. And I truly believe the reason why I kept having supernatural experiences is because I didn't doubt that he could do it. I expected him to do it. And he always comes through. Just like matter of fact. mm -hmm. Childlike faith. Childlike faith. And I was going to say something about that. I'm so glad you said that because there was a little girl. I heard this story. There was a little girl on an airplane and there was really bad turbulence. It was nighttime and everybody was freaking out on the plane. And the little girl just slept the whole way through. She didn't, she didn't bud. She didn't, she just slept like a baby. So when she got off, um, the people on the plane came to her, you know, the passengers, and they said, weren't you afraid? And she said, no. Well, they said, did you feel anything? She said, oh, yeah, I felt it. She said, well, why weren't you scared? The people said, why weren't you scared? And the girl said, because my dad's the pilot. <laughs> so when nice. your father is the pilot, you have, you trust him. Like you have that that childlike, like you said, the childlike faith, mm-hmm. just like the Bible says, where God will always sustain you. He'll always protect you. So, yeah, just don't doubt. Don't allow yourself to doubt. And if you feel like you're around if when you get around certain Christians who I don't believe that I don't believe this, I don't sometimes if you hang around those people too much, you're going to become like them, um, you know, and especially if they're not receptive. It's, it's one thing to be around people to help them in their faith. But if they're resistant, they're going to change you. But if they're receptive, you'll change them. So vision of Jesus. What happened there? Oh, which one? Which one? Uh, can? I don't know. Uh, mm, any of them. All of them. Um, Okay, let's talk about, this is the one, okay, this is the one that didn't make it to the book. I wrote the book in 2014, and it was- How could a vision of Jesus not make your book? Yes. You have too many visions. I I just didn't have room for another vision of Jesus. Uh, (laughs) This one was awesome. This one, I believe, was the most awesome, because it happened right after my book was published in 2014, and I said, Lord- why in the world did you let this? Well, how come you didn't save this for, you know, before I published it? But it was the time where I actually literally touched Jesus, saw him like literally face to face up close. Well, um, there. OK, so one night I had went to bed, but it was an open vision. It was so weird because I was literally there. So I had went to bed and I found myself in a place and this place was a place of desolation. And everything around looks so, I don't know, destroyed, right? But there was um, a castle-like building. And I was standing at the entrance of the castle doors. And underneath was a moat and across was a bridge. Prior to that, it's so weird. Prior to that, there was, I spent time, well, prior to that, I spent time with Jesus the day before, literally, in this vision, me and Jesus spent time together. I remember spending time together, but the odd thing is, I can't recall exactly what we did. 
but I know we spent all day together. And then he said, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll come back. So that day I'm waiting for him because he told me where to wait. And I was waiting for him and I was waiting for him to be on time. So I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm like, and I'm getting frustrated because what we're human. We get frustrated sometimes. And I'm like, he said he would be here. He said he would be here. Where is he? And as I'm frustrated, Ken, I see this beautiful man walk from the left hand side and he stood right in front of the at the entrance of the uh, bridge of the bridge. So I'm at the doors. He's at the very end on the other side of the moat. And he stood there and he looked at me and he put his hand out like this. Yeah, he put his right hand out like this and he stood there. And me, I was still frustrated. Why? Because I was still human, right? Um, and I'm like, you're late. I feel like you're late. But God is never late, right? But I felt like he was late. And he stood there and he kept his hand out and I had a knowing, a knowing that he would stand there for a thousand years waiting just for me. That's the love of God that I knew. So as I walked towards him, right, I saw him. And when I saw him, I saw pure authority. You know how everybody likes God's love. Yes, he's love. Yes, he's all that. But I, I already knew that because that's who he is. But the one word that came to mind, the, wor- the one word that was, was existent, the one word that was everything was authority. I mean, even when he walked, you just saw authority, authority. That's it. It wasn't Lord of all what he is. That's who he is. You know, love. Yes, that's what he is. All these things. But it was pure authority. So I came and I, I eventually came to him and I gave him my hand and we began to walk together. And as I walked with him, I remember my left shoulder. I think I maybe I made a video about it. I think I did. I'm not sure. But my left shoulder touched his right arm. And I felt him and he was solid. I mean, Jesus was solid, but he wasn't hard. He wasn't like a bodybuilder, but he was masculine. He was everything a man um, would be. Um, He was brawny, shall I say. Um, He was wearing a white, white gown. Um, I saw his eyes. I don't care what people say. They can get mad all they want, but Jesus has blue eyes. People get so upset when they hear that, but his eyes were blue (laughs) and alive. They were alive where when you look inside, you saw life. You just can't explain it. And I figured the only way you could ever uh, imagine is if you actually saw his eyes. His eyes were alive and they were full of love. He had a full manicured beard. It wasn't like a long one, like Duck Dynasty. It was perfectly manicured, a beautiful beard. Um, and he was just amazing. And and this is when, I guess, we stopped to look at each other. And then we kept walking. And as we walked, this was a most powerful thing, Ken. As we walked, I saw, I saw a beast on the right and the left of us, right, trying to get at me. Not at Jesus, but to get at me. They were after me. And one thing I noticed is that when I, when I, Years later, I was like, these beasts were ugly. It reminded me of, I don't know if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings. I just saw it once, I guess, years ago, like 20 some odd years ago. Um, the beast from Lord of the Rings. You remember that ugly little thing? A little, my precious. <laughs> that thing, just like that. <laughs> That's good. And I said, you know what? A lot of these Hollywood, this is why I'm really cautious of these movies in Hollywood because... A lot of these things, these things, these people see these things and they just recreate it on film because that's what I saw. I saw those things come, those things come towards me. Mind you, I'm not into stuff like that. This is just what they look like. And I saw this, you know, years after and, um, but they couldn't, they couldn't get to me because I was with Jesus. And that was the most powerful, one of the most powerful things that I had gotten from that, um, experience was that as long as I was with Jesus, as long as I was, because Jesus is always with me, but as long as I was with Jesus, they could not harm me. They could not touch me. They wanted to get me, but they could not get me. So we walk, long story short, we walk and we walk into a cave. And then as I look down on the ground, Jesus says, do you see that? And I say, the two tiles? And he said, yes, one had an elephant on it and another one had some writing that I didn't understand. And then he said, do you know what that means? And I said, no. And he said, within a year, India will come against itself. And I said, huh? He said, within a year, India will clash against itself. And and, 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 and not so certain terms, but that's what he said, that India will come against this, itself. And then it was over. And I was in my 
I was out of the vision, open vision. So I woke up and I began to search out what's happening in India. And I did that for probably a good month or two or three. Nothing whatsoever. Ken, would you believe a year later, this is when I was on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook anymore. Um, Deep Believer is the ministry, but not me personally. Um, I got two messages from people. I had no idea who they were from India. And they wrote me and they said, please pray for me. Two people. One said, please pray for me, but not just me, for India, because India is under attack. And then they went on to say that um, there's new leadership and the new leadership, under the new leadership, they are attacking Christians. They're beating them with chains. They're raping nuns. They're burning down churches. They're burning down houses of Christians. And then there was another person who wrote me and who said, please pray for me because Indians are very, very tight. Their families aren't like Americans where we're just, we're okay just leaving each other. And they're very tight and family is everything. But he told me that he said, please pray for me. I need your help because I am the, he said, my father is a high up official and he's disowned me because I gave my life to Jesus. And um, he was Hindu. Um, His whole family was Hindu because most of India is Hindu. So he said, or Buddhist. So he said, please pray for me. I love my family, but I have to choose Jesus first, which I thought was beautiful. So I said, okay, I pray for him. So then I tell one of my friends, you know, about these people. I pray for them. But then I'm telling one of my friends, I'm like this, you know, these two Indians just contacted me out of nowhere and just told me and asked me to pray for them within a two month, two month time span. And I told her about the last one. And she said, that's really odd because in India, they're very um, accepting of any religion because they have over 33 million gods and Jesus is one of them. They don't care. So she said, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. So I keep doing research. I'm like, okay, the last guy who said um, how his father is a huge official and things had changed. I looked it up and lo and behold, Ken, about a month after I had that vision is when India's government had changed. A month after. So I'm looking in the wrong places, I guess. But it happened just the way Jesus said it would happen. India came against itself. And I, I don't know where the article is, but I can send it to you. Um, I wrote, matter of fact, I think I wrote um, an article on it. How step by step by step, how things uh, had happened a month later after Jesus told me that. Because he said within a year, not in a year, within a year, which means within 365 days, this is going to happen. And India, Indian Christians are facing a lot of persecution even still, they didn't happen before before this government, but this government came in, this new leadership came in, and Christians were being persecuted. So that was the what that was the time that I saw Jesus literally face to face up close. Um, yeah, so that was the first time that I saw him close face to face to face to face to face. Like this is like I saw God Himself. You know, I saw Him other times, like in the book, but this was this didn't reach the book, and I was like. So what led you to uh, starting Deep Believer and listening to other people's stories and, and sharing them openly? Good question. Really good question. So there was a woman who would come to my house. She would come unexpected, but it was fine. She would come ever so often. We went to the same church. And I realized, even before this, I realized that whenever I would share my testimonies of the glory of God and how he's working so much and how he appears to to us and how he heals us and have you know give us miracles signs and wonders all this stuff christians weren't the ones who believed but the non-christians were the ones who believed and who actually went out and bought bibles when i would share my testimonies or those were the ones the non-believers who were who would agree with me and say i've actually experienced that before and i said to myself there's a deficit so then what really put the nail in the coffin was this woman who had come to our house ever so often unexpected um, she, she would come on a scooter. She was so sweet she would come on a scooter. And, um, she came over and we let her in and we began to talk about God. Mind you, we went to the same church and the Bible says we're supposed to believe the same thing, literally. And the verses, I know Ken, I said, you know, earlier, I'm not keen on verses, but I did write it down. when you see first Peter three, eight, Philippians two, two, Romans 15, six says, we're all supposed to be of the same mind. And because if you're not this is why Christianity is so all over the place now, not Christianity itself, but why we are so combative towards each other and there's no unity is because we are all of an unlike mind. But God is not a God of confusion. So 
she came to the house and we began to talk and then we began to talk about God. And then I said to her, I said, if Christians knew the power that we have in Jesus Christ, we would have so much power. I said, there are battles that have been lost that didn't even have to be lost because people, not people, but children of God don't know the armor that they have because Jesus says, put on the full armor of God. So even though, so that means we have access to it. We have it in possession, but it's not on for a lot of Christians it's not on. So when people are like, oh, there's dents in my armor, but a lot of times you're not even wearing your armor. You got to put it on for it to be dents on. So basically I broke it to her. I said in, in a nice way, because I'm thinking like we're having a conversation like me and you are. And I'm like, if Christians knew the power that we have in Jesus Christ, I'm like, we can, I mean, like the devil doesn't have a chance on us. She looked at me. Can she reversed out of my house? I never saw her. <laughs> I didn't see her for a good three years after that. And I was like, can I said, I said, there's definitely a deficit because she got uncomfortable when I mentioned the power of God, the power that we have in the power of God. And we went to the same church. So I thought we believed the same yeah. thing. Scripture says the kingdom of God's not a matter of talk, but of power. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And that's a pure example of, of, of what I just mentioned. So after that, I said, you know what, Lord, use me for whatever you want to use me for. This is years ago. So then I'm in Connecticut. So now I'm in Colorado. And then I'm at a church in Colorado. And um, there were there were members of the church there who were high up in the church, you know, church positions and all this. And I was wondering, how come I just can't? get in. You know what I'm saying, Ken? Like, you know, when like you go to a church, you just want to, you know, be a part of something. Yeah. And I said, why can't I get in? Why can't I get in somehow? And the Lord, he says to me, I've never used a church to prosper you. So he answered my question. Like Jesus always, you notice in the Bible, Jesus answers questions to things that we don't really, you know, when, when people would ask him questions, he would say something else because that's what you're really getting at. So I guess what I was really saying is how come I'm unable to use my gifts here? Why can't, why aren't these people realizing that I have gifts here to attribute to the church, to help build the church? That was, I guess, what my heart was saying. But I'm thinking, Lord, how come I can't get in? What is wrong? You know, and then Jesus literally said, I have never used a church to prosper you. And I kid you not, Ken, I kid you not. That same week, the Lord helped form Deep Believer, literally. I got a call, not a call, but I got a LinkedIn invitation from some lady named Linda. And mind you, I just, I was just doing a blog, Deep Believer blog, that's it. And a woman named Linda, she contacts me and she says, would you like to interview um, one of America's top cardiologists? He's the number one, he's number 1% top cardiologist in America. And at first, Ken, I'm saying to myself, absolutely not. I've never <laughs> interviewed anyone before. I don't have that much experience in it. It's not, no. But then I remember there was a woman sh at the Biggie, because in Connecticut, there's this huge, not sorry, Connecticut, in Massachusetts, we would travel because New England's pretty small. We would travel once a year to what's called the Biggie. And the Biggie was this huge fear that like all the states come together in New England and we just have a ball. And as we went there, there was a vendor there. She had oil. She would sell all these yummy different olive oils of all different kinds. And I spoke to her and, she, and I asked, I said, how did you get to where you got to? And she said, I had tenacity. And I said, okay, elaborate. She said, look, she said, I started small. I started in my kitchen. But what happened is my husband told me, look, you have tenacity where you kept going where no one, where everyone else would have given up. But you kept going, no matter what the obstacles, you didn't stop. And when she said that, I said, you know what? Maybe I'll just have some tenacity. <laughs> I'll have some tenacity. Even when it seems as if, you know, maybe it won't go anywhere. I'll just, I'll just go. I'll just go. So I said to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to tell this woman yes. And when I tell her yes, no one's going to watch the interview anyway, because I don't even have a real channel. You know, like when you have a YouTube channel, you just start off. Yeah, this is, you know, maybe like words of encouragement or this is my family, small stuff like that. So I said, nobody's going to watch it anyway. Ken, I said yes. And I think within two months, we were at 200,000 views. Wow. <laughs> and that's how it started. 
And it was only because I said yes. I said yes. So when fear creeps in, sometimes fear creeps in because the enemy knows your calling. Sometimes he does know that God has something big for your life. But the power of a yes can change things. It can move mountains. And it's all for glory, the glory of God. So like Deep Believer, when you see Deep Believer, it's never me. Um, it's all for God. It's not my ministry. It's God's ministry. I have nothing to do with it except, Lord, I will interview those you want me to interview. I'll ask the questions you want me to uh, ask. And it always has to bring glory to God. So everyone who I interview, if it doesn't bring glory to God, you will not be on the show. It's not going to happen. If it if it glorifies yourself, if it was just to promote, it's not going to happen. But if it's really to build the kingdom of God, because my goal, my my heart's desire was for the army of God, the children of God to come together and rise up and know the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. And that a lot of things that we go through, we really don't have to go through. Ken. It's a lot of things that we really don't have to. There are some things we do, obviously. Yes, because this world is a fallen world. But it's a lot of obstacles in this life that we don't have to go through if we know the power and authority that we have in Jesus Christ. And if we know and use our armor that God gives us. He doesn't give us armor because everything is going to be cake. No, he gives us the armor because there's a war. But I mean, what? A victorious king never leaves his people, so he'll fight with us. But um, so that's why Deep Believer was created because, I mean, from its inception until now, it's all to bring the glory of God back to the children of God. Let us know, have the knowledge that we are children of God, which gives us so much authority. And even when I've interviewed ex-witches and warlocks and all that stuff, they always say it's so much power in Christianity, but the Christians don't know it. They but don't know it. <laughs> that was my, up until recently, I kind of did a rebrand, but my slogan was basically three quarters of Americans believe in the paranormal. But this excludes most of the stories where people are having encounters with God. And so that's what this platform is for, just to start to invite people to not only to tell the church people like, hey, it's not just church. Like it's what you're doing is real. And if it's not, um, you're not doing it right. And for the paranormal believers to say, hey, there's not just uh, this boring religion and that's Christianity and it's dead and lifeless. So you're drawn to the paranormal. The Bible is the most paranormal book ever written. It's, do you believe in aliens and the paranormal? What do you think God is? God is some kind of outside creature that doesn't live here. You know what I mean? It's like it fits all of those categories. We just have different lingo. And um, yeah, I appreciate you. You're kind of fun. You're spunky. And uh, I like your channel. I was telling you that I listened um, to your best of 2022 while I was working out um, and or sometimes when I'm driving they're great stories so if people don't know Deep Believer YouTube it's stories it's actually some of Jennifer's stories but it's um, stories from all kinds of people um, it, it telling their supernatural encounters uh, with God and it's really it's, it's really interesting and um, share with how they can find find you Sure. You can find this on YouTube under Deep Believers. You can also find us on deepbeliever.com. We're on Twitter, Deep Believers. So everything is Deep Believers. So you go to Instagram, Deep Believer, Facebook, Deep Believer, um, YouTube. So we're all over. So if you go there, you can find us. And I can assure you, you will assure you that you will hear things you've never heard before. I can assure you, you will hear and see things that it will cause you to open up your Bible and try to look for it and try to search for it. Um, but yeah, it's all just to bring recognition and glory back to God and to build the army of Christ back up. Oh.